lectures. Uh, this has been made possible by the uh, COP Charitable Foundation, so we're very thankful to them. Uh, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Scott Sumner, our distinguished speaker today. Dr. Sumner is a professor of economics at Bentley University. He received his PhD from the University of Chicago. Uh, and his research has been mainly uh, on the field of monetary economics, uh, particularly on the Great Depression. Uh, Sumner, Dr. Sumner, just began research on the relationship between cultural values and neoliberal reforms, but then with the financial crisis, he got pulled back into studying monetary policy. And he started blogging uh, two years ago. Uh, the name of his blog is uh, The Money Illusion. And he told me last night that he started uh, blogging because he started getting frustrated about monetary policy and he wanted to change how monetary policy is run nowadays and he wanted to have an impact on monetary policy today. Uh, Dr. Sumner uh, has published several articles in journals such as Journal of Political Economy, the Journal of Money, Credit and Banking, the Bulletin of Economic Research, The Economist, among other many journals. Uh, he will be presenting his lecture today. He will talk between 30 to 40 minutes. Then um, Dr. Sumner, Sumner also told me that he will be open to questions during his presentation. So he really wants to get a feeling about uh, how you guys are uh, doing with the material and, and, and his ideas. So feel free to raise questions along the presentation. But then we will have a, a couple. We will have like around 10 minutes for Q and A towards the end. Uh, yeah, between 10 and 15 minutes. Uh, we also have a reception, thanks to the uh, Cobb Foundation, uh, around, around 1, once we finish the lecture. So please uh, feel free uh, to go to the, to the reception. Dr. Sumner will be there also. If you have uh, questions or more further conversation on the topic, he'll hang out at the reception. So I hope you, you're able to take advantage of that. So please uh, join me to welcome Dr. Sumner today. So I'd like to thank uh, Lisa Blanco and also Dean Wilburn for inviting me uh, to this uh, very beautiful campus. I have to say I'm a little bit jealous of uh, you guys. Uh, we had a brutal winter in Boston shoveling snow, so coming out here it seems kind of like paradise by comparison. And um, so anyway, thanks for inviting me. Um, I'll be uh, talking today about uh, the crash of 2008 and the, the recession, monetary policy, and um, market efficiency, sort of time permitting. Um, I see these two issues as related, and um, you'll see why as we go along. Um, but um, first, a little bit about myself, and uh, Luis already mentioned sort of how I got into uh, blogging. Um, in fact, you know, in a sense, the reason I'm here is because of this crisis. I, I wasn't a particularly well-known academic uh, before 2008. Um, and uh, I got into blogging because I realized that my research on the Great Depression and the Japanese liquidity trap and uh, forward-looking monetary policies, which was my three major research areas, uh, gave me sort of a different take or insight on the crisis from what I was seeing from others. And um, you'll find my view probably very unconventional, um, regardless of whether your professors are sort of liberal Keynesians or conservative monetarists. I, I have a, a different take from almost anyone else, and I suppose that's why I'm here, because in the blogosphere, if you have something new to say, then you, you get noticed, especially if people find it interesting. And I've been fortunate that other economists have had some good things to say about me, and otherwise I probably wouldn't have uh, got much readership. Um, so anyway, uh, and again, it will be a controversial uh, talk, um, and I certainly welcome questions and, and challenges to my point of view, and also clarification questions as I go along. Um, let me start doing the slides. Um, one common view is that the events of 2008 and the subprime bubble sort of discredit the efficient markets hypothesis, and I'm going to argue just the reverse, um, that in some sense the crisis happened because we didn't take this theory seriously enough. Um, and also I'm going to argue that uh, almost everyone is, is at least partially wrong about what happened in the crash of 2008. 
Uh, I don't think that this was a, um, the root cause was a financial crisis, but rather contractionary monetary policy. And right off the bat, that's pretty controversial because most people in the media and in the economics profession saw monetary policy as being not just expansionary, but highly expansionary in late 2008. So obviously I'll have to do some explaining to try to convince you of the alternative view. Um, let's start off with a fairly uh, common or consensus view. Um, this is just the first four sentences by um, in an article by Robert Hall, a very distinguished economist in the Journal of Economic Perspectives, just came out in a symposium on the crisis. And I think this is a fairly commonly held view, these thoughts, but if you look closely, it, it may not actually accurately describe what happened. Let's start with the first two sentences. We have the worst financial crisis and the Great Depression followed. Is that true? Well, having studied the Great Depression, I noticed that the first banking crisis did not actually occur until more than a year into the Great Depression. And I would argue that the causality ran the opposite direction, that the Great Depression itself caused increasingly severe banking crises as we went into the 1930s. One variable that I'll, I emphasize a lot in my blog is nominal GDP, the total dollar value of income in the economy. And in the Great Depression, that fell in half. So four years into the Depression, people were earning on average half as much as four years earlier. You can imagine how hard it is to repay loans when your income on average has fallen in half. It's not surprising there was a banking crisis. Some might point to the stock market crash, which did happen right at the beginning of the Depression. But I think we now know that stock market crashes by themselves cannot cause depressions. How do we know that? Well, in 1987, there was a stock market crash that was eerily similar to 1929. If you overlay the two graphs, they're almost identical. And uh, there wasn't even the tiniest blip in the economy after the 1987 stock market crash. GDP kept rising steadily for the next three years. So a stock market crash, even of the type of 1929, doesn't seem to, by itself, cause a depression or even a mild recession necessarily. Now what about 2008? Here it's a little more complicated. Um, clearly there was a subprime crisis before the recession. So you can certainly talk about causality going from that to the recession. However, I think it was more complicated. Notice that Robert Hall mentions the um, second worst financial crisis struck in the fall of 2008. That's after Lehman Brothers failed. And I'm going to argue that that, which was sort of the intensification of an earlier subprime crisis, in fact represented a feedback from a weakening economy. So even there, the causation to some extent went from the recession to the banking crisis. What made this more complicated was we started with a modest-sized banking crisis, went into a severe recession, and the banking crisis worsened. And I'll show you some evidence for that later on. Um, OK, here's uh, an interesting graph that shows estimates of monthly real GDP in 2008 and 9. Now, the government doesn't actually calculate monthly GDP. They calculate quarterly. But this was put together using some data, uh, monthly frequency data, by macroeconomics advisors. and. What it really shows is that much of the decline in the economy took place in a very short period of about six months. Between June, see if I can use the, the laser here, the June point there, <coughs> and December, which is there. So from June to December 2008, real GDP saw most of the decline that occurred in the entire recession. Even though the recession was much longer, I think it was about 18 months in all, the big decline took place in a fairly short six-month period. Also notice that the financial crisis that Robert Hall talked about occurred about halfway through this decline. He mentioned the fall of um, 2008, September, October, November, that period. So I'm going to argue that part of the problem was that the financial crisis got much worse because of the weakening economy. Now, why did real GDP fall sharply? Uh, 
The next slide shows nominal GDP. And if, if I toggle back and forth, you'll notice that these two look fairly similar, except nominal has a little more of an upward trend because of inflation being included. Um, but in this place, again, there was a peak in June. Um, and in December, the low point for nominal GDP was reached. Now, nominal GDP is something that most economists believe that monetary policy can, at least in principle, control. Um, even economists that are skeptical about whether monetary policy can control real GDP normally believe it can at least control nominal variables. And uh, furthermore, most mainstream economists think there's a connection. You probably have been taught models having to do with sticky wages and prices so that if you have a decline in nominal spending, it doesn't just show up as falling prices, but also real output falls. So that's um, one of the connections that I would make here, that essentially monetary policy did not adequately support nominal GDP, allowed it to fall too much, and that led to a decline in real GDP as well. But even nominal GDP itself is interesting, as I mentioned. It's the resources people have to repay loans. On average, nominal GDP in America rises about 5% per year. That's about 3% real growth, 2% inflation. That's on average. Between mid-2008 and mid-2009, it fell about 3%, meaning it, it fell 8% below trend, normally 5% up, 3% down on this occasion. That means people had much less income to repay loans, and businesses also had much less income to repay loans than they expected prior to the um, drop in nominal GDP. So essentially, uh, what I'm going to be arguing is that there were really two crises that were mislead, misdiagnosed as a single crisis. The first crisis, I think people got right, and I don't have anything new or interesting to say about the subprime crisis. Clearly, a lot of mistakes were made by government policy, banks. You can find all sorts of villains. Loans were made that, in retrospect, never should have been made. And even if this had not happened to nominal GDP, a lot of subprime loans never would have been paid back. It was inevitable the, the bubble, so to speak, was going to burst. And, and I don't have much to say about that. What I will talk about is the intensification of the crisis in the second half of 2008, which spread far beyond just the subprime mortgages. Now, I'm going to argue for the key role of monetary policy. And this is perhaps the most difficult claim I have to make, because most people uh, tend to think of monetary policy in terms of interest rates. Low interest rates are seen as easy money. High interest rates represent tight money. Uh, but it's more complicated than that. And um, the textbook I used by Frederick Mishkin, I can't remember, this is the book used here? No, we use Mankey. OK, Mankey. But this is for monetary economics, yeah. where I teach it's good, yeah. at Bentley. And and this is, a, I believe, the number one uh, sales for money making books, at yeah. least when I adopted it. So it's a very uh, well-known and distinguished textbook. Michigan was on the Board of Governors of the Fed. And um, here are three key points he uses to sort of summarize his conclusions about monetary <coughs> policy towards the end of the book. First, it is dangerous to associate easing or tightening a monetary policy with falling or rising interest rates. Um, I claim that many economists slipped into this mistake. It's certainly true that oftentimes interest rates are informative about monetary policy, but they can be deceptive. And I think in this instance, they were. Um, second, other asset prices uh, besides those on debt instruments, in other words, other indicators besides interest rates, can tell us whether monetary policy is easy or tight. And finally, monetary policy can be highly effective in reviving a weak economy, even if short-term rates are already near zero. I believe in late 2008, many people, even many economists, lost sight of this. Or maybe they never believed it in the first place, because there are different schools of thought on the so-called liquidity trap. Frederick Mishkin is taking the view that interest rates at zero do not mean that the Federal Reserve is, quote, out of ammunition. There are still other things they could do to boost aggregate demand and nominal spending other than cut interest rates. So in one sense, the, although my view in my blog is very controversial, it shouldn't be that controversial because I'm relying on some fairly uh, 
you know, well-established propositions in monetary economics. But if you followed the news in late 2008 and then looked at these three propositions, you might have scratched your head a little because this certainly was not the standard view in the news media at the time. Um, okay. Uh, and here's another example I like, a quotation from one of my favorite economists, Milton Friedman, uh, during the Japanese uh, liquidity trap period. Um, he pointed out that uh, he takes a contrarian view. Low interest rates are generally a sign that money has been tight. Now, how could he make this claim? Well, notice he says, has, yeah, has been, not necessarily is. So if you've had a tight money policy, that can depress spending in the economy, leading to lower output and lower inflation. And both lower output and lower inflation tend to depress interest rates. Because I spent a lot of my career studying the Great Depression, this didn't seem too surprising to me. In the Great Depression, interest rates fell almost to zero and stayed there for quite a long period of time, mostly reflecting weaknesses in the economy. But at the time, people thought that the Fed was providing easy money in the Great Depression. So there was a perception that the Fed was doing a good job. Later on, Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz wrote a book that presented a new view of the Great Depression, arguing that actually money was tight and people were looking at the wrong indicators. And um, so this new view has become somewhat accepted. In fact, Ben Bernanke, uh, I don't remember the exact quote, said something at a dinner honoring Milton Friedman to the, to the Something like, uh, well, you were right, we did it, we're sorry, and we'll never do it again. You know, Bernanke, of course, re referring to the Federal Reserve. And um, so, anyway, um, Friedman <coughs> was surprised during the Japanese uh, liquidity trap, if you want to call it that, of the late 90s and early 2000s, that people just assumed the Bank of Japan had done all they could and that there was easy money in Japan, whereas he argued exactly the opposite. Monetary policy was contractionary. Now, some people will respond to me and say, well, yes, we know nominal interest rates can be misleading, but you can always look at real interest rates. And surely that would tell us whether money is easy or tight. I actually have two responses to that. One, even real interest rates can be misleading because they will tend to fall during a severe recession, a severe downturn in the economy because businesses are doing less borrowing, there's less demand for credit. But if we want to talk about real interest rates, let's look at what happened to them between July and the beginning of December 2008 when this sharp contraction took place that I've already showed you. Now these are in real interest rates. How do we know that? Because their interest rates on what are called index bonds. Um, index bonds pay you a, a specified real rate and then the actual return you get includes an inflation adjustment computed after the fact when inflation uh, is measured. So the basic rate on an index bond is in fact the real interest rate. Those rates rose, oops, uh, those rates rose from less than 1% on five-year treasury index bonds in July to just over 4% um, at the beginning of December, the end of November. And then they started to decline as the economy got weaker. So if real interest rates are the right indicator, monetary policy actually could be argued to have been very contractionary. Now, uh, the Michigan mentioned in this textbook that you have to look at other indicators besides interest rates to really see what's going on, to see the stance of monetary policy. And he mentioned looking at other asset prices. So here's an example of a different type of asset price, commodity prices. These are very sensitive to market conditions. They're flexible. They move up and down day by day. And what I'd like to point out here is that uh, commodity prices peaked in the middle of 2008, around July. You may remember back in 2008 that uh, oil prices got very high and you were paying, I don't know, in California it's higher than here, maybe up to $5 a gallon at the peak or something close to that. And then they fell for a while and now they've been coming back up again. So you see the um, big fall that took place between July and December. <coughs> 
back up a little. And this graph is out of date. They're higher now than, and all commodity prices have gone up. But I just wanted to focus on the big drop. And this, I don't know if you can see the scale here, but this is more than a 50% drop. Commodity prices fell in half. Uh, the value of the dollar is another interesting asset price that can tell us whether money is easy or tight. And um, during late 2008, this is what happened to the trade weighted exchange rate, meaning the value of the US dollar against the basket of other currencies, sort of the average exchange rate. You can see that starting in the middle of the year, it's at around 96 on this index, and at the end, it's over 110. So maybe a 15% appreciation of the dollar just in a short period of about six months. That's a very strong appreciation. And one of the things that's kind of interesting about this is sometimes people argue against my hypothesis, uh, and they make this argument. They say, well, look, how can you blame monetary policy for playing a role in this? Because if you have a f severe financial crisis, you almost always have a severe recession. However, the vast majority of those financial crises around the world in places like Thailand and Mexico and Russia and so on are situations where the currency of the country in question depreciates in the teeth of the crisis. It falls. It reflects weakness in the economy. It's very rare to have a you know, financial crisis of this sort and see your currency rising dramatically during the crisis. A couple previous examples that I can think of is in the early 1930s, the US dollar was strong in real terms during the crisis, the banking crisis. And Argentina, about 10 years ago, when they had a period of deflation and banking crisis, their currency was strong in real terms. It was fixed to the dollar, which was appreciating at the time. Interestingly, those two previous examples are both cases where many people in retrospect feel that policy was too tight, too contractionary. The U.S. in the early 30s, Argentina around the year 2000. So it's a little bit different from the ordinary financial crisis. Uh, and here's some other asset markets. Stock prices uh, crashed in late 2008. The second half of the year saw an enormous decline in stock prices. Commercial real estate prices, I think, are a very interesting indicator because unlike housing, the commercial real estate market stayed strong throughout 2006, 7, and even the first half of 2008, when housing was already declining very significantly. Why was commercial real estate strong during this period? I would argue that uh, it wasn't as affected by the subprime bubble, and that when it did decline sharply, it was reflecting weakness in the economy. So, um, whereas the earlier declines, and by the way, I don't know if you're familiar with the term subprime bubble, most economists separate out two parts of the housing market. Areas like uh, Florida, Arizona, Nevada, and I think you call it the Inland Empire here, where housing prices got very inflated and then crashed sharply, was what I talk about as being a bubble unrelated to tight money or anything like that. That was a crisis that was going to happen based on uh, mistakes made earlier. But the commercial real estate market, I don't think, had to crash. I think it crashed partly because of the severe recession that began in the second half of 2008. Also, the U.S. has a very complicated real estate market for residential homes. There were some areas like the heartland of the United States, most famously Texas, that did not see a housing bubble. Housing prices did not soar because there was plenty of land to build. And in those areas, <clears throat> housing prices did not fall during the 2006 to 2008 subprime crash. However, in late 2008, prices fell a little bit even in Texas. My explanation would be that's reflecting the weakening national economy. So we sort of have two situations here. We have a um, subprime situation, which is sort of localized, although it affected the whole U.S. to some extent. And then um, other asset markets that, like residential real estate in the heartland, commercial real estate, stocks, commodities, these sorts of assets, 
that reflected monetary policy and economic weakness in the last half of 2008. Um, and then finally, the, the tips spreads. Um, these are the gap between the interest rate on a regular treasury bond, <coughs> conventional bond, and an index bond, which is the real interest rate I just referred to. So if the interest rate on a regular bond is 5%, if it's 2% on an index bond, the gap, the 3% gap, represents expected inflation, what investors think inflation will be over that period of time. During this period, in late 2008, that spread fell very, very sharply. In fact, it went negative for some types of tips. That is, there was a short period of deflation expected by the financial markets. And in fact, the consumer price index did fall between mid-2008 and mid-2009. So that was quite a turnaround from fairly rapid inflation in early 2008. So um, one analogy I use is that um, <clears throat> it would be like someone that had a cold that turned into pneumonia. We had a certain problem, a subprime crisis, and it morphed into a bigger problem, a lack of nominal spending or aggregate demand in the second half of 2008. And we were still treating it as if it was a cold that had just gotten worse, whereas it was actually an illness that maybe required antibiotics or something. It couldn't be treated the same way. And because it looked similar, it was natural for people just to think the problem, quote, the problem is getting worse. In my view, there's more than one problem here. And, um, well, what would be an, the other analogy I sometimes use is um, someone is suffering from pneumonia. They're walking to the hospital to get treated, and on the way there, they get stabbed. And, you know, they are brought into the emergency room, and the doctor says, um, there's no need to treat this knife wound. The patient's real problem is pneumonia. Well, a problem is pneumonia, but also another problem is a knife wound that needs to be treated. And I think that the U.S. economy in late 2008 suffered from two problems. A financial problem, having to do the banking system and its exposure to subprime mortgages, and an aggregate demand problem that wasn't fully recognized as being separate, that could be dealt with with separate tools. Um, to use maybe one more analogy here, um, when the Federal Reserve in late 2008 was trying to rescue the banking system, I don't think they were addressing the fall in nominal GDP, the fall in aggregate demand. As a result, it was like bailing water out of a boat without first plugging the leak through which water is coming into the boat. So they were sort of trying to bail out the banking system, and then every time a month later they would go, the problem seems to be even worse. We've done all these things to fix it, and the estimated losses are even larger than before because of the weakening economy increasing the size of that. And I'll, I'll present some data in a minute to uh, show you that um, pattern. Okay, um, a few comments on of bubbles. I have a sort of a contrarian view of, of bubbles. Um, I'm not going to argue that the people are wrong about the United States and especially the subprime states being a bubble, but I would just caution you that bubbles are not always as easy to spot as you might think. Um, I just pulled this graph off the internet, um, but I didn't sort of cherry pick these four countries. If you'd taken a bunch of European countries, I could have shown you the same pattern. And the pattern I'm going to try to show here, it's going to be hard, but um, right about here in 2005, a lot of people were calling a bubble. Okay. And if you look at these four countries, the blue line represents the United States housing market, the average housing price. Clearly those who warned about a bubble we're correct for the United States. Prices today, and this is again not quite up to date, but they're still much lower than they were in 2005, even though they went up a little bit first in 2006. And then there's two other countries, um, New Zealand and uh, Britain, where prices have sort of zigzagged, but are about the same as they were in 2005, even though they also had seen sharp run-ups to that period. Australia, 
the red line actually has seen prices rise sharply since 2005. So think about it. Already in Australia in 2005, it looked like a housing bubble. And yet, here we are six years later, and prices are much higher. I don't know the exact numbers, but I think 20 or 30 percent higher than in 2005. Interestingly, Australia is the only major developed country, at least that I'm aware of, that did not suffer a recession in this crisis. And what this tells us is that, to some extent, the health of the housing market reflects the business cycle. Now, I don't mean to suggest that's the only factor. Again, in the subprime sectors of the United States, I think even if we didn't have a recession, those areas would have suffered. But the total decline in asset values was higher than necessary because of the recession. So it was two problems. Um, a, a lot of discussion recently on the need to reallocate resources is sort of a reallocation theory of the recession, which is this. Once the subprime bubble collapsed, you had all these unemployed construction workers. These people needed to find jobs elsewhere, so it was inevitable we were going to have a recession. I think that's wrong. It's, it's right, but it's wrong in terms of the scale of the problem. What was inevitable was that the U.S. economy was going to have a slowdown because of the subprime bubble bursting. But if you look at this red line, um, again, it's a little hard to see the data here, but it peaks in 2006. This is um, housing sales, I believe. But if we had done construction, it's the same pattern. Construction peaked, for instance, in January of 2006. Now, just keep that date in mind, January of 2006. By April of 2008, housing construction had fallen more than in half. Most of the decline took place between beginning of 06 and April 08. And yet, by that time, unemployment had only risen to 4.9%. So there had been very little increase in unemployment. The unemployed <laughs> construction workers were often working in commercial real estate and manufacturing. Exports were booming during that period. Other fields. And then in late 2008, output fell across the board in the economy, most sectors. Services, manufacturing, construction, everything went down sharply. Unemployment skyrocketed to over 10%. This graph shows um, uh, some data connecting nominal GDP and the size of the financial crisis. These are estimates from the International Monetary Fund. Now, the white line shows you their estimate of the size of the banking losses in the United States in different uh, periods. So they estimated in April 2008, um, then later in 2008, this is January 2009, April 2009. So in early 2009, estimated losses were almost three times as large as in April 2008, even though the subprime crisis was fully understood. And it was known, these are very large losses even here, almost a trillion dollars. but. When the economy weakened in late 2008, the estimated size of the losses in the banking system almost tripled, indicating to me that maybe as much as two-thirds of the problem with the banking system was recession-related. On the other hand, when the economy started to recover, the estimated losses got smaller. So the other graphs are the, um, their estimates of inflation and real GDP growth. I couldn't actually find a separate estimate of nominal GDP, but that's the sum of inflation and real growth. So these two lines falling here show that forecasts of nominal GDP growth were falling sharply and then rising uh, after the recovery started. Policy implications. Um, my preferred policy is to stable nominal GDP growth. Uh, this is different from most central banks that favor targeting inflation. So um, since nominal GDP had been growing at about 5% annually, I favor a policy of sort of sticking with that at growth rate and aiming for about 5%. And I think that would have done much better in crisis. Um, targeting the forecast, um, I have proposed creating a nominal GDP futures market that would provide guidance what the market expects nominal GDP to be 
We already have market expectations of inflation I showed you from the TIPS market, but a market forecast of nominal GDP would be very useful. Lars Svensson, a famous economist at Princeton and also the Swedish Central Bank, suggested using internal Fed forecasts. And one way of explaining this is to imagine a, a captain steering a ship uh, across the ocean. And imagine asking the captain where he hopes to end up, and the captain says New York. And then you ask him, where do you expect to end up? And the captain replies, well, given current currents and waves and wind conditions, I expect we'll end up in Miami. So I'm aiming for New York, but I currently expect we'll land in Miami. You'd probably ask, well, why don't you turn the wheel a little bit and adjust the course to reflect the currents, the winds pushing the ship off course. Why don't you set your uh, course such that your forecast of where you're going is the same as your goal variable? And this is basically what Svensson is recommending for central banks. If they want, say, 2% inflation, then adjust monetary policy so that they expect to get 2% inflation. If they want 5% nominal GDP growth, set policy so they expect to get 5% nominal GDP growth. And in late 2008, they were not doing this. Both inflation and nominal GDP forecasts were falling well below uh, expectations, or, or, or well below their goal of what they wanted to achieve. Oops, what, what happened here? <laughs> I sped through these accidentally. Okay. Um, I, I, I've got it. Okay. I'll just, uh, I just hit the button too hard, I think. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, Here's a good example of what I mean by targeting the forecast. The most important Fed meeting in this crisis was in September 2008, two days after Lehman failed. The Fed voted to keep interest rates unchanged to 2%. Now, in retrospect, I think that was a mistake, and probably even they would agree it's a mistake. They probably should have cut interest rates. Interestingly, they said the risks of recession and inflation were equally balanced. They were looking backwards at historical inflation data that had showed very high inflation over the previous 12 months. But the TIPS markets were showing that inflation was likely to be very low, in fact, below the 2% target that the Fed is usually assumed to implicitly have. And it was actually only 1.23% on the day of their meeting inflation over the next five years, annual inflation. So if they had been targeting the forecast, they would have cut interest rates sharply because both inflation and the recession worries both indicated uh, rate cut was appropriate. Now, um, the analogy I use here is steering a car. It's as if they were steering the car by looking in the rear view mirror at past data, the last year's inflation data. And if you try to steer a car looking in the rear view mirror, you're going to be all over the road. I'm arguing they should look down the road at the point they're trying to reach and steer towards that point on the horizon of what the goal of monetary policy is. So, uh, what should have been done? Um, I'm not going to get into all the technical points. I think I'll leave some of these to Q&A. But um, Ben Bernanke, uh, about eight years ago, told the Bank of Japan you need to show Rooseveltian resolve. Meaning you have to be determined to provide a boost in aggregate demand or raise prices if you want to. At that time, Japan was suffering from deflation. Um, so the, the central bank has to be very strong and aggressive during a severe crisis. cannot just be passive. Leaving interest rates constant can be effectively tightening monetary policy if the economy weakens and credit demand falls. Um, they should have first lowered interest rates to uh, enough to achieve on-target growth for inflation, and then um, promise to do what's called level targeting, which is to make up for any near-term shortfalls. So if they're aiming for 2% inflation, and they only get 1% one year, they should try to get 3% the next, so that inflation averages 2% over the whole business cycle. That's something that Ben Bernanke recommended that the Bank of Japan do, but interestingly, the Fed has not done that. Um, 
in similar circumstances, I would argue. Okay, um, what else could they have done? Um, they adopted an interest on reserve program, paying interest on bank reserves. And, and I understand why they did this. With all the money being pumped into the banking system, they were worried about high inflation. Normally, expansionary monetary policy is highly inflationary. But they actually overreacted, and we ended up with deflation over the next year. Because they paid interest on reserves for the first time in Fed history, which encouraged banks to hold on to the reserves instead of moving them out into the economy. Now, ironically, they probably will need this program during the recovery, because with all this money there, there's a danger of excessively high inflation during the recovery unless they pay enough interest on reserves to encourage banks to hold on to some of this money. But they essentially did a program that might be needed <coughs> at some point too early, is what I'm essentially arguing here. And a uh, similar mistake was made in the Great Depression in 1936 and 7, uh, when they doubled reserve requirements. Increased demand for reserves is actually deflationary. I recommended a negative interest rate on reserves. Uh, I think I was the first person to do that in an article, but I'm not certain. Anyway, the Swedish Central Bank did a little bit of that in 2009, so I was happy to, to see that. Um, and interestingly, I don't know if this is why, but Sweden has recovered more rapidly than other Western European countries from the recession with this um, program. Um, they should have done the quantitative easing that they did in November 2010, two years earlier. So um, I have been very critical of fiscal stimulus, which was the path pursued by the U.S. government. Tax, uh, mostly spending increases, maybe some tax cuts, but deficit spending basically. I didn't think it would be very effective, and I'm also worried about large deficits. Monetary stimulus does not require deficits, and I think it also can be more effective. When fiscal stimulus seemed not to be working very well in the middle of 2010, we had persistently high unemployment for quite a while. Policymakers went back to monetary stimulus and adopted the quantitative easing program. Now, my prediction was that if they did do quantitative easing, you should observe higher stock prices on the rumors of quantitative easing. And we saw that. A weakening of the dollar, we saw that also on rumors of quantitative easing. Uh, higher tip spreads, that is somewhat higher inflation forecasts, and they went up from about 1 to a little over 2% with a quantitative easing. So it does seem to have had the effect on asset prices that I had predicted earlier. And um, I'm not trying to claim to be someone that can predict the future of the economy. I want to assure you, I was as caught unaware by the crisis as most economists. What I do is I make conditional forecasts. That is, if they do this, this is what should happen. And, and a crisis by nature almost is very hard to predict, a banking crisis. Any of us that could, could get rich by speculating in the markets if we knew when crises were coming. But at least we should, at a minimum as economists, be able to make conditional forecasts that if policymakers do this, here's the result you should get from that policy. Um, and also the results were uh, consistent with the uh, predictions in Michigan's textbook. Um, I'm going to just, I know I've run over a little, let me just finish up with uh, maybe this slide and, and then I'll take questions. Um, I have a different take on policy from most economists. Most economists take what I call a wait and see approach. Um, do policy and wait and see how it works. I think the markets tell us right away whether policies are likely to be successful or not. Whether we've done enough policy uh, stimulus will show up in things like the tips markets where we can see inflation expectations. And if we're targeting the forecast, driving the car, looking down the road, we should be able to look at all sorts of market indicators to tell us whether what we've done is adequate or not. Um, and the markets were telling us from September 2008 that the monetary stimulus was inadequate and in retrospect, the markets were right. The performance of nominal GDP falling so far below trend indicates that we would have been better off with a, a more stimulative monetary policy at that time. And I think it's a scandal that the government has not 
set up and adopted a nominal GDP futures market. It would be very easy for them to do, not very costly, and it would provide very valuable information about where the market thinks the economy is going, sort of an early warning indicator of uh, a weakening economy. So um, I think uh, since I've run a little bit over, I, I'd rather just stop and ask you guys for questions um, at this point. Okay. Tom Church, um, uh, I know you favored quantitative easing back in, in 08. Was there any fiscal policy that you would have found adequate or helpful in 08 instead of the policy? Yeah, um, if they're going to do fiscal stimulus, I favor tax cuts. And particularly not, I don't like lump sum tax cuts. I like cuts in marginal tax rates. Um, because I think they also have a little bit of a supply side benefit and boost business confidence investment. Um, one interesting idea um, would be to cut the employer share of the payroll tax temporarily. And the reason that might have some effect on unemployment is because I believe part of unemployment is due to sticky wages. So when nominal GDP falls, wages typically don't fall as much. And that wage stickiness means workers get laid off. If you cut the employer share of the payroll tax, then companies are implicitly paying less total compensation, even though the worker doesn't see a change in his or her paycheck. So it, it lowers, it, it sort of overcomes a little bit of the wage stickiness problem. So that would be the, my preferred uh, fiscal approach, would be some sort of cut in marginal tax rates. Do you see a be viable way to sell that to people other than, you know, we're giving tax cuts to businesses instead of people? That, that's the problem. And, you know, they did do a small payroll cut at the end of last year, but it was exactly the opposite. It was on the... It's, it's, they have a Keynesian demand side focus, like we need consumers to spend more. So they cut it for the workers themselves. But I just, uh, I'm a skeptic. I'm not saying the Keynesians are completely wrong, but for many reasons, I think that the impact of Keynesian um, demand side stimulus, fiscal stimulus, is not as strong as Keynesians expect. And I think that showed up to some extent in this crisis. But, you know, obviously the economy didn't seem to be Recovering unemployment wasn't falling as recently as November. It was 9.8%. So, um, I mean, I know the Keynesians said we should spend even more, but this, how much uh, deficit spending is appropriate, especially given all the fiscal problems around the world right now. So monetary policy does not require a budget deficit. That's an important distinction that has to be kept in mind. So, I, mm -hmm. um. If, if Bernanke, uh, Bernanke is, is a Great Depression scholar, and, and you, you seem to say that at, at some point he had an idea, and he even went back and apologized for some of the things that You're he right. has done. Uh, does he seem to have changed? Uh, does there see, seem to be any change in, in what he That's a very good question. Um, his view of the Great Depression is slightly different from mine. He, he puts a little more emphasis on the bank failures as a cause rather than as a symptom. And so his focus was early on on rescuing the banking system. And I can sort of understand why. I mean, if the banking system collapses, there's going to be all kinds of problems. I, I do understand that. But I think he lost sight of the, the demand side. Now, over the last couple of years, Ben Bernanke has been working quietly behind the scenes to try to get some more monetary stimulus. and. The Federal Reserve is very complicated. There are battles within the Fed. The Fed does not like to have open controversy. They like to pre present a united front to the public. So he was trying to arrange a compromise policy within the Fed uh, that would be acceptable to all factions there. And I believe that, personally, he wanted to do a little bit more a little bit earlier, although maybe not as much as I would have. But I think he was... Uh, a little bit frustrated, especially in 2010, um, about the pace of the recovery. Um, but I do think in 2008 he focused too much on rescuing banking. Maybe that needed to be done. I'm not really an expert on banking, but I think other things on monetary policy, not just quantitative easing, but other techniques could have been used as well, and um, that would have been helpful. So uh, it's one difference is the visible and the invisible. The financial crisis is very visible. It's all headline news. 
a drop in nominal GDP is almost invisible to the public. It only comes later in the data do we actually see the results. So you have to really have your eyes uh, sharply focused on some forward-looking indicators to really see when it's about to sort of fall off the cliff and there's going to be a big drop in spending. Would you say that because Bernanke is such a political figure at this point that it causes him to lose sight on some of the non-headline type of issues? It could be because he has to deal with so many issues, right? Um, uh, you know, he has to deal with a lot of things that are beyond my uh, expertise, and that may lead him to lose focus. Uh, you mentioned political figure. He also has to deal with perceptions that um, a lot of people are worried inflation is going to be too high over the next few years. And so that also has made the Fed cautious. And that's the point I made about all the reserves injected in. I, I'm sort of a monetarist leaning economist, and monetarists typically believe that causes a lot of inflation. Only because of the interest on reserve program did I take a different view of that. So in some sense, my presentation today goes against my monetarist roots from the University of Chicago, which are that this would normally be highly inflationary. In the long run, it would be if they persisted in this policy. And they will have to pull back at some point. But I think fear of the unknown and all the money going out there led them to pull back on doing any more. They sort of felt, well, we've already done a lot. And what they had done a lot, but not exactly in the area where it was needed. So, other questions? Just quick, what's next? I mean, we've already we've spent so much money fiscally. We've gone through, you know, QE2. What's what, what's there left to do? QE3? <laughs> um, well, the good thing about monetary stimulus is it's, it's not costly in the long run, really. It's, it's, a, it's a transaction that can be reversed. Um, there is some risk to the riskier assets the Fed bought. That's a little bit of a side issue. Um, yeah, I mean, we're, it's a problem because we've run up large debts and I think the United States for many years will be struggling with fiscal policy trying to get its house in order and they're going to probably have to be some painful changes at the federal level on fiscal policy but I don't think we can do more on fiscal to promote recovery we, we probably the deficits as big as politically is acceptable anything else needed to be done to have to be monetary I hope I have my fingers crossed that QE2 is enough to get the recovery accelerating this year and there's a few early signs in the last few months of data suggesting maybe things are picking up a little bit. But we don't really know for sure. Well, I think we're going to finish now. I know some of you have to go to class. Uh, so I really thank you for being here. It's such an interesting lecture. I surveys because we want to get your feedback about the lecture then I also pass around the sign-up sheet for the macro class and then uh, come to a reception in Goldway Cardio right outside right here uh, please come and join us and Dr. Sumner will be there for more questions so thank you so much